history of the Rally Mark dates from the end of the last century. From 1896 to 1938, the company was under the control of the Rally family. In September of 1938, it was acquired by Lord Nuffield and in 1952 became a member of the British Motor Corporation. In the late 50s and 60s, the Rowley name was used on a succession of BMC cars, eventually disappearing from the showrooms in 1969. This appreciation of the Rowley RM series covers the years from 1945 to 1957. These were the last true Rowleys whose origins could be traced directly back to the models produced before the Second World War and have since become highly prized classics. Before we look at the RM series in detail, let's set the scene with a brief look at Rowley history. From the 18th century, the Rowley family had been involved in weaving. However, in the 1880s, the weaving industry was in decline and, hoping to maintain the family prosperity, William Rowley acquired the cycle business of Bonnick & Company Limited in 1890. The business flourished and on the 23rd of May 1896 the name was changed to the Riley Cycle Company Limited. Pedal cycles, tricycles, quadricycles, motorcycles and motorised three and four wheel cycles were all manufactured over the next few years. In the early 1900s the company had great success with the tricars and 1905 saw the first actual car, a nine horsepower model which was very successful in hill climb contests. In 1907 the company marketed the first fully detachable wheels in this country and this became a major part of the company's activities prior to World War I. In 1912 the name was changed to Riley Coventry Limited. The war saw Riley engaged on aircraft work and in 1919 the new models were announced. The side valve engine had arrived and the cars carried the now famous V-shaped radiator in the Riley Diamond. By 1920 the Riley Works had moved to Falls Hill near Coventry and the 11 horsepower car was holding its own and winning in competitions. In the early 20s Riley were working on new light cars in 1926 the prototype Rally 9 was seen at Shelsley Walsh Hill Climb and over the next 11 years over 27,000 were sold in many different forms. The 1930s saw great successes with fine cars such as the Alpine, Stelvio, Lynx and MPH in racing, rallying and trials. Nine horsepower and six cylinder cars were produced such as the Lincock, Gamecock, Kestrel and Falcon. As the 30s progressed, more innovations and technical changes were made. These included the one and a half litre 12.4 and Big Four 16 horsepower engines, the forerunners of the RM series engines. By 1937, Riley's range of cars was extensive catering for most motoring tastes. This, in part, contributed to the financial problems Riley encountered. A loss was disclosed and despite gallant efforts to preserve the company, it went into receivership in February 1938 and Lord Nuffield acquired control in September of that year. A reduced range of models continued in production until the outbreak of the war. The war years were spent making parts for the government and in 1945 the RM series was created. The post-war Riley advertising campaign started in 1945 by promising that utility and austerity would find no place in the new car. Built to tradition, as old as the industry, as modern as the hour, performance, safety and inherent quality will blend to give Magnificent, magnificent motoring. motoring! In August 1945,
the first pictures of the new car were published in the motoring press who called it the best Riley yet with the advertisements promising more to come although the new models were virtually impossible to obtain in 1946 due to shortages the advertising and publicity campaign continued the new Riley one and a half saloon was aimed at the professional classes its purchase price of £555 plus £154.18 and fourpence purchase tax set it way beyond the reach of all but the relatively affluent. To put the price in perspective, small Fords and Austins were sold for under £300 plus tax. The new model's sporting pedigree was appreciated by the motoring press, who wrote about remarkable road holding and sports car behavior with town carriage manners of the new Riley 12. Halfway through 1946 the price rose to 675 pounds plus 188 pounds five shillings purchase tax. Leaflets were being produced for the home and export markets Riley Coventry Limited for the home market and Nuffield Export Limited of Cowley for the overseas. At their introduction to the motoring press at the end of 1945 the new Riley 12 certainly caused a stir. By the time production got underway properly in February 46 the model was known as the one and a half litre. Early cars featured side jacking points through the running boards. The bumpers were made of bronze and the exhaust pipe exited behind the near side rear wheel. Dashboard tops were rounded off. In the engine compartment the air box was initially of the pre-war type then cylindrical and fixed adjacent to the bonnet side. Features that continued for a considerable time were the opening right hand windscreen and carriage type bonnet locks a rear window blind and centrally hinged scuttle vent. During the early production certain materials were difficult to obtain and a large number of early cars featured black overriders. Most early cars appear to have been finished in black cellulose although a reduced colour range was supposedly available by special request. From late 46 two-tone paintwork was also available and the renowned Mountbatten split became a popular style in later years. During 1948 to assist the export drive left-hand drive cars were manufactured and certain components were specially detailed for other countries such as the 150 and 170 km per hour odometers Roof coverings could also be requested in colours other than black. In July 1946 the two and a half litre Riley Saloon was announced. Compared with the 55 brake horsepower of the one and a half litre engine, the new two and a half litre power unit gives an output of 90 horsepower on the brake, said the advertisement. High performance and very fine road holding are the outstanding features of this new car, said the motor. Priced at £880 plus £245 3 and 10 pence purchase tax, this car was described in the motor as an outstanding event in Riley history and a very worthwhile contribution to a tradition of great motor cars emanating from their factory. In the first three years, over 4,700 cars were produced over 4,000 being one and a half litre versions. The advertising campaign featured both one and a half and two and a half litre cars with the slogan Riley for magnificent motoring with many beautiful illustrations showing Riley's in prestigious surroundings. This is Alan Dixon who's been the owner of this car for approximately 16 years now. It's an early two and a half RMB. Alan, tell us some uh, ins and outs of the early, early two and a halves. 
Well, they, they differ a great deal from the, the later cars in that you've got uh, a, a simpler braking system. It's uh, a hydraulic front and a mechanical rear, which was shared by a lot of cars of, of the early era. Um, it has a slightly lower um, power rating than the later engine. This is a 90 horsepower engine. I believe the later ones were 100. So it, it's, but it doesn't seem to make a great deal of difference where performance is concerned. And, and maybe the fuel consumption is a little better as a result of that. Some of the features that mark it out are, it has carriage locks on the side of the bonnet as opposed to internal locks inside the uh, passenger compartment. Um, this particular car has um, a rather unusual feature in that it has Bedford cord seats, uh, which I believe was a feature for about a year when leather was in short supply because once um, they were over, over that period, all riders after that were back to all leather seating. But it's a, it makes it a particularly comfortable ride, particularly on a hot day, that they breathe very well with you. These are the carriage locks that are found on the early cars, both one and a half and two and a halves. I believe the feature was dropped uh, by 1949 when uh, I, the public were complaining that the, the cars weren't secure enough and they wanted internal locks that were operated from inside the passenger compartment. These are the Bedford cord seats that I mentioned earlier and other features on, of the car are the very nice wooden uh, mouldings on the, t on the top of the door sills not found on later cars, they were, they were rather simplified by then these are the operating controls for the wipers controlled first of all from the driver's side and then this can be brought in separately if the, uh, if the passenger so wishes this sort of movement can be brought about the later cars were controlled from a button in the centre of the dash. On the backs of the seats, in the early models, you also find another feature, which are these map pockets. Uh, they were dropped in later cars, but they're rather nice and they give a, a, some extra oh, and useful on journeys. A very nice feature of the early cars were the, the round instruments and, the, and rather more curvaceous uh, dashboard. Um, this seemed to uh, pick up traces of the 30s in, in, in the style. The um, handbrake is a, a, an umbrella handbrake mounted to the left of the steering column. Um, a nice feature, although uh, you do have to find somewhere to put your left knee at times when you're operating it. In the spring of 1948, the Riley Roadster was announced. The government's export or die policy pointed the Nuffield organization towards the huge potential market in the USA. 507 roadsters were built between 1949 and 1951, with just over 60% exported. However, only 50 actually went to America. The press were kind to the roadster and welcomed the return of the rarely traditional British open sports car. Priced at 880 plus purchase tax, the Roadster was the same price as the two and a half litre saloon. This is Pete Harrison, he's the uh, Social Secretary South of the Rally RM Club. Uh, Pete's a Roadster owner and in fact he's rebuilt this car. Uh, Pete, tell us a little bit about the car and what you've been doing in it. Uh, for people who uh perhaps don't know too much about them. The uh, Riley Roadster was supposed to be to complete the RM range of cars. It was only produced for three years, although it was hoped to have done more, uh, between 49, 50 and 51. Uh, it was designed primarily for the American market, as everybody knows, uh, to try and sell more cars into America, which were then increase the license to buy steel but uh, by the time it got on the road and got sold into America the ideas of 
the American market had changed and therefore it failed somewhat miserably. Now as to the car itself, for reasons best known to themselves, Riley's produced a car with, apart from the engine and gearbox, slight modifications to the chassis, most of the body panels are not interchangeable with any of the saloons, even down to the bonnet being two inches lower than the saloon. Therefore, even the grille is a, and for people who've worked on the cars, you can see the cut mark and braze mark on the back of the grille. Wings, they're a lot wider. The bonnet is wider in itself. There is one, we believe, a panel that could be similar, and that's a center strip between the bonnets. But that's about the only similarity, consequently, um, in rebuilding or in any renovation, it's impossible to pick up spares that will uh, be representative. Now, oh, engine-wise, yes, that is a two and a half engine, but because the body is lighter, the whole center of gravity is lower, is a much livelier car. And I think anybody who has driven roadsters for any amount of time will dearly love them and very few then give them up for any other form of Rileys. This one is with our group in Bristol. It's been quite a number of places uh, in Europe, uh, France, Holland, Spain, and even down to Portugal when three of us took roadsters right down to Porto and back. The excuse was we went to look for a pub and we found it. <laughs> The Roadster chassis is basically similar to the 2.5 litre saloon, having the same wheelbase and front suspension, although the rear springs have less leaves. The main differences are the modified rear cross members, vertically mounted fuel tank, revised rear jacking points and outriggers to carry the robust bumper setup, together with additional body mounting plinths lower radiator fixing and altered brackets for hanging the modified raspier exhaust system. In September 1948 changes were announced for the 1949 models. The two and a half litre saloon will have an increase in power and develop 100 brake horsepower. The brakes will be improved on both the one and a half and two and a half litre cars and heaters can be fitted as an optional extra plus other small improvements will be made to the range. A surprise for the 1948 motor show was the Riley Drophead. This was the first motor show held in Britain since the war and all manufacturers were keen to show off. Prototypes of Dropheads had been seen as early as July 1946 at the Motor Industry Jubilee Parade and were mounted on one and a half litre chassis. Dropheads were produced between 1949 and 1951 and a total of around 500 were made. All production models had two and a half litre engines. The price £950 plus purchase tax, a total of £1,214, 12 shillings and 10 pence. One of the 1946 prototype dropheads is now owned by Jim Fletcher, who is the drophead technical advisor for the RM Club. Yes, this isn't a normal drophead, this is uh, one of the works prototypes. They, they built four of them, uh, four bodies in 1946-47. Uh, it appeared in the Jubilee uh, Rally, the, uh, the, the first sort of motor show. They couldn't have a motor show in 1946, so they had a grand parade of new cars in Hyde Park, and one of these was in that parade. Not this one, but uh, Riley, you know, as you know, started out with a new model straight after the war, uh, and they obviously thought that the drophead was going to be a desirable model. It didn't go into production for another, um, what was it, uh, three years, uh, now this prototype is a little bit different to the ones that went into production. Uh, it's 
the first thing about it is it's on a one and a half litre chassis and all the production ones are on two and a half litre chassis. Uh, the detailing is just a little bit different. The, um, the distinctive feature is this header rail here, uh, which is shallow and the hood comes right over. Um, very, very pretty detail in my view. The sill is quite a bit different on these. It's the same as the, the saloon. It's, it's recessed right underneath there. When they came to build the production drop heads, they strengthened this up with a big timber running right the way through. But it, it gives a rather elegant line, doesn't it? Uh, the other interesting thing about it, being an early car, you see 1947 body, it's got this lovely interior detailing, the, the, the woodwork and the round instrument dash that you've seen on the saloons. Uh, it's, you know, a very nice feature, I think. Of course, to, tiddly little back window, but uh, that doesn't matter because if you look at the size of the rear view mirror here, the mirror is just enough to see the full size of the back window. So There is one other detail on the drop heads that gives a bit of trouble uh, for people rebuilding, and that's the, the rear window. If you can just come round, I'll show you. See, it, it's a... It's a kidney-shaped uh, brass frame uh, and the, the inner lining and the outer lining has to clip into that. Uh, some of the prototypes um, used a wooden frame, more like the saloon, but of course that was a very heavy component in the, in the hood, so they, I think, used this detail for most of the production cars. They almost got it right the first time. Uh, they, the body is probably a little, a little less stiff than the prototype, than the production one, because they, uh, they put a bit more stiffening behind the back seat as well. <coughs> and that helped. <coughs> it's a lovely car to drive, particularly, you know, in the one and a half form, which is a nice light, uh, light, light car to drive compared with the two and a half. In 1949, it was announced that after 51 years of car production in Coventry, Riley were to move to Abingdon and share quarters with the MG Car Company. The Riley factory in Coventry would be an extension of Morris Motors Limited engine branch and would contribute to the production of power units for the Nuffield organization as a whole. The Riley RM series were produced in Coventry from 1945. In 1945 production was painfully slow getting underway because of the unpredictability of supplies, a problem which affected every British car manufacturer. However, production went over the 3000 mark by 1947 and maintained that level until 1950 despite the move. 
the Abingdon made cars, which started to appear in July or August 1949, were produced in a new range of finishes, including metallichrome. The dashboards were completely altered. In fact, the interior of the car was upgraded considerably. Production continued during 1950 and 51, but by the beginning of 1952 it was clear that the 2.5 litre saloon would eventually be replaced by a completely new model, while the 1.5 would be heavily updated by revised styling. In the meantime, stopgap changes would be made. In the years 1949 to 1951, a total of over 9,000 cars were made. Glenn Crawford is a long-time owner of RMs, particularly the earlier models. Glenn, can you outline the production variations that took place during the transfer of manufacture from Coventry to Abingdon? Well, yes, I've owned both the Coventry and the, and the Abingdon type. This one uh, that I've got at the moment is a 1949 Abingdon car, making it one of the first couple of hundred that came off the line once they moved production from Coventry to Abingdon. It's difficult to say from the outside of a car, in fact it's difficult to say without reading the little plate inside where a particular car was actually made, because the uh, features of the Abingdon cars merged from the Coventry ones rather than changing overnight. Uh, but you can have hazard a reasonable guess by peering at the interior trim and uh, looking at some of the exterior fitments as to where a car was made. There's certainly no difference in quality. Uh, they were all built to extremely high standards for cars of the day. Uh, the interior trim modernised as time went on. The, uh, the door trimmings became more complicated uh, with, cap with wooden cappings running around the entire window frame. But you could find a Coventry car with that feature uh, as well as an Abingdon car with that feature. And really, without opening the bonnet and peering inside, like I say, you can't actually tell where a car's come from. Regarding the inside of the cars, Glenn, um, the changeover of the trim and the dashboards was notable, but what do you feel is the, yeah, well, the, yeah, the yeah. more appealing interiors? Well, this is, of course, down to personal taste. And no doubt the designers thought that they were doing everybody a favour when they moved from the great big round pre-war looking instruments to the modern square uh, golden backed instruments but uh, it's a classic looking car and I think the classic looking dashboard suits it much better. Soon after the formation of BMC in March of 1952 engines were identified by letters and the cars retrospectively called RMA for the early one and a halfs and RMB for the two and a halfs. Then the Roadster became the RMC and the drophead, the RMD. A series of engine modifications were made to the two and a half. The RMB2 engine was introduced, identified by the single belt auxiliary drive arrangement with minor modifications internally. In the second half of 1952, the revised one and a half became an RME, and the two and a half became an RMF with new transmission and brakes. At the 1952 motor show, the RME and F were featured with an enlarged rear window, which improved visibility and a raised rear roof line giving more headroom in the back seat. However, factory prices and purchase tax increases did not help sales figures. The one and a half litre saloon was £1,339, 5 and 6 pence. The 2.5 litre saloon was £1,642, 5 shillings and twopence, including purchase tax. First, let's take a look at the early RME. The body, both outwardly and inwardly, was similar to the RMA. It still had the small back window and low line roof. The interior mirror was still mounted on the screen centre pillar. The rear blind continued and the door panels and seats remained the same. The main changes were to the all hydraulic brakes and an open prop shaft and hypoid rear axle. 
With the introduction of the large rear window and high roof line, a dipping rear mirror was now fitted and the rear window blind discontinued. The seats were revised, the front ones to bucket style, and later a galley heater fitted as standard. Now a close look at the RMF. This is Len Holland, uh, he's the owner of JUN 406. Uh, I think you've had the car now for something like 17 years, have you, Len? And, I, have, I have. And what have been your experiences of using the 2.5 RMF? Uh, I find it quite a remarkable vehicle considering its age. Uh, its capabilities of keeping up with modern traffic is quite remarkable considering it was built so many years ago. Uh, the road holding and the steering. Uh, is it's just excellent. In fact, it's compatible with many modern vehicles. So I find it quite a excellent vehicle to use as a classic vehicle and an everyday vehicle as well. Keep it's it nice. Certainly a credit to you anyway. It's a beautiful car. Thank you very much. Although its performance and drivability had never been in question, the RMF styling was now regarded as dated, and sales had dropped drastically. Things were about to change. In October 1953, Riley announced the Pathfinder, designated RMH, which replaced the 2.5 litre RMF, and at the same time gave the 1.5 litre a new look with new wings incorporating head, side and fog lamps, latterly known as the spatted RME. These cars, for 1954, received a lot of press coverage which welcomed the modernisation of the Rileys and noted all the equipment now available as standard. The prices. RME, basic £850 and £1,205, 5 and 10, including purchase tax. The Pathfinder, basic £975 and £1,382, 7 and 6, including purchase tax. Pathfinder deliveries were very slow getting underway after the launch, which may have been because many of the problems had not been developed out properly before the car went on sale. This was done and by mid-1954 a thoroughly reliable and safe car was being produced. There are a lot of spatted RMEs around today, so let's have a good look at them. The restyled body was to revitalise one and a half litre Riley sales 
after the car was displayed at the October 1952 Motor Show. The model has since become known as the Spatted RME due to the removable panels in the revised rear wings. The front wings were restyled with integral head and side light pods and the fog lamps were now built in. The old style running boards were replaced by sills and the door bottoms made to be flush with the sills. Petrol caps were changed, rear waist strips lengthened and the front quarter bumpers altered to fit the new wings. The roof gutter was now to be a chrome section with rubber insert. During the production run minor alterations took place, most notably the substitution of the D-lamps with wing mounted rear brake side lights and a centrally mounted reversing lamp. Paint colours were altered to include two-tone and metallic as standard. Twin carbs and a rev counter were optional. At the October 1954 motor show, the two cars were exhibited again with only minor changes. The special show edition of motoring dated October 1954 said, the imagination of the public has been captivated by this entirely new and spacious saloon of imaginative body design with its 102 brake horsepower engine capable of a maximum speed under ideal conditions of more than 100 miles per hour. It was then upgraded to 110 brake horsepower for the 1955 model with overdrive offered as an option. John Bolster said in the Autosport of February 18, 1955, I have driven every Riley model produced in the last quarter century. This is the best car ever to bear the name of Riley. The Autocar Road Test said, The Pathfinder is a first-class sports saloon. It has a very good all-round performance and a high standard of detail and finish. With all these qualities, it represents very good value for money. Here we have two dedicated followers of the model, Harry Wright and Chris Neal. Chris, would you like to comment on the car's reputation and your own experience in driving one? Well, I think the Pathfinder has earned a, an undeserved reputation for not staying on the road. Uh, there were certain reasons for that which came to light very early on and were in fact rectified. And most of the criticism, I think, would be true to say, comes from people who have never driven one. Certainly those that have driven my car, and a few people have at the rallies, have very much revised their opinion of it. Uh, we recently did a feature for Classic Car, and they test drove the car and were, appeared very impressed with it. And I think that speaks for itself. We certainly don't make any allowance for its age in modern day traffic conditions. We drive it on the motorway, we keep up with modern traffic, we tow a fairly large heavy caravan, period caravan, and we cruise at 60 miles an hour with that without any difficulty. Harry, as far as uh, the running of the car generally, what are you, what's your thoughts on uh, the reputation? Well, it's not just mine, but out in 1955-56, when the car first really got on the road, I know it was introduced in 54, but we had several writers from the current magazines at the time, like the Motor, Auto Car, etc., and they were full of praise for the car. As a matter of fact, they went as far as to say they thought it was the best Raleigh that has ever been made, and I quite agree with them. The comments that one hears from time to time about our ditch finders and 
We've heard a lot about the Clayton de Wandry servo not being much good and all that. I think it's a load of piffle. It's up to the people who own the car to, to keep the servo in a good condition. And I find that seals break down on the servo, give trouble, and the people say, oh, well, the servo's no good. They throw it away and buy another one. But that one's been on there since the car we've had it. And I've had no trouble other than replacing the seals. The car is is a very good car in my opinion. The only trouble I find with it, and I think Chris may agree with this, it should have had power steering on it. That would have made a vast difference. And secondly, they ought to have had synchro on bottom gear because we have a lot of trouble with, with bottom gear, with the uh, lay gear and the bottom gear and reverse gear because it's not synchro. But other than that, I, I think the car is great. We love driving it. The only difference I've done on that car is to put an overdrive on, which makes a very vast difference to the car. I love it. I wouldn't be without it now. I think it's great. And that is, uh, was an optional extra originally? Or? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It could be purchased, but I suppose there wasn't a lot of motorway traffic about in those days. And possibly people didn't think it was desirable or worth the expense. But it certainly is nowadays. Yeah, the, the overdrive was actually offered on the cars later in the production yeah, room, wasn't it, yeah, Harry? Late 56. That's right. Yeah. So it, it is not uh, a straight fit in the earlier model. Oh, no, you can't put it on a 55 because the chassis is different. That's right. You, you know that because you made a bit. Sure. <laughs> Should I say that? On Why yeah. not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you made me a bit on the chassis to uh, cut the other piece out and put uh, the new one in. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, uh, it's requires a, a bit of engineering, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. So. But it's it, on the later car, 56, the late 56, 57, the chassis is there, ready for the overdrive. No modifications necessary. It's only the early 56. And the 55, you can't do it because it's got the manual clutch on it. It's against the hydraulic clutch. And, well, you can do it if you change the bell housing, you know, a lot of technical stuff. The Pathfinder engine, although basically similar to the later RMB2, had its compression raised to give 102 brake horsepower and later, more usually, 110 brake horsepower, with thin steel head gasket and high crown pistons. Outwardly, the main differences are the restyled rocker covers, sloping oil filter, reshaped exhaust manifold, altered inlet manifold, different fan blades and repositioned airbox. The interior of the Pathfinder is usually famed for its right hand gear change and wide bench seat although separate bucket seats were available. It's a very airy and spacious car giving a soft comfortable ride. The other side of the road. <laughs> yeah. From 1952 to 1955, almost 4,000 one and a half litre saloons, over 1,750 two and a half litre saloons, and over 3,600 pathfinders had been produced. By August 1956, the Riley Pathfinder was the only car carrying the Riley name. The one and a half litre RMs had ceased production in 1955, and the final Pathfinder rolled off the line on February the 12th, 1957. By the 1957 motor show, only the 2.6 was on display, and the tried and tested four cylinder Riley engine had gone forever. The final cars passed through the showrooms during 1957 and with them magnificent motoring came to an end. In all, 28,065 RM rallies were produced. As well as the standard saloons, roadsters and dropheads, 
Riley built almost 250 cars in chassis only form for outside coach builders to finish with special bodywork. Some were made into estate cars or utility vehicles, others special sports variants and saloons. Bonalac, the coach building firm, made a number of specials based on the one and a half litre Riley while the Riley body plant was on strike. Epps Brothers of London produced three different drophead styles. Continental companies built specials too. There are records of a drophead coupe built on a 1947 chassis in Holland and Reinbold and Christie AG of Baal, Switzerland and Kong displayed their versions at the Geneva Motor Show in March 1949. Other companies recorded are Verhul of Holland, Crosby and Cowley of Douglas Isle of Man, who supplied one of the official course cars for the 1948 Isle of Man TT motorcycle races, and Head Brothers in Australia, who made a sports special and was raced with some success during 1950. EVN 808 had a perspex roof and non-standard lights and radiator grille built by an unknown company. Tickford manufactured a rollback conversion top for RM Riley's. A photograph from News Exchange, the monthly journal published by Nuffield Export, showed another Riley special with an Italian body designed by Carrozzeria Vignali. The car is on show at the Italian Motor Show. At the Centenary Rally, we talked to John Kirby, RM Club Spare Secretary, about his Epps drophead. It's the prototype Epps body. Um, they built ten in total, but this was the prototype one, and none of the others followed the same pattern. Um, the distinctive thing about this particular one is the windscreen and I have a letter from Harry Epps, one of the co-owners of the company, uh, describing how he decided on, on this particular windscreen design. And they'd almost finished the car in the workshop and he went to a movie one night, came home and decided that this cord roadster that he'd seen in this movie had a beautiful windscreen, so he got the men in the workshop to strip it down. Uh, rebuild it and this is the windscreen that's on it today. The rest of the car is almost all aircraft duralumin. The only the wings and the running boards that are steel. It's all oak uh, framed, mm -hmm. even the seats, the boot floors oak, uh, even the boot lid and the spare wheel cover are oak framed over with an aluminium uh, this dural covering over it. The running gear is just totally standard RM except that I've converted it because of the reduced weight of the body I've converted to two and a half back axle and to balance up two and a half front brakes to go with it. And what condition was it in when you found it? Uh, if, I, if I said it had simply stood outside with its hood down for about 25 years that describes it rotted. Um, no, no upholstery, no internal steel work for the seats all, all disappeared. The bodywork itself was quite good. Right. Wing, wings and running boards were terrible, but the body, with it being dural, hadn't even oxidised. And of course, with the being oak frame, the, the wood was in good condition. Right. Apart from one outer sill, where they'd obviously made it up for the first time, and it was like plywood. And they'd obviously made it one shape, decided that was wrong nailed a bit more wood onto it, shaped it again, built it up again, and it was built up in layers. Now the second, the other side was a single piece, so once they'd built one side, they'd got the shape, then they married and, and made a, a mirror image for the other side. And handling of the car, is it uh, Very good. better than the normal one and a half? Yes, or? because you've got a much lower centre of gravity, the, the cornering, the acceleration's better. Um, not so much on the hills because of the two and a half back axle, right. but on the motorway we'll happily sit all day at 70 mile an hour. As far as driving with the hood down, is that a, a buffeted experience no, in the back? Or the, it... the advantage with the deeper doors is that although they don't look as dainty, they do protect you extremely well from the wind.
in the front of the car at least. Estate cars and commercial vehicles known as utility vehicles were both exempt from purchase tax and entitled to a greater ration of petrol than private cars. Wooden body Riley estate cars were built between 1946 and 1950. They were built by Bonalac and smaller firms such as J. Urquhart and Son of Petersfield in Hampshire, Village Garage of Netherhampton near Salisbury, Vincent's of Yeovil and Robert B. Massey of Market Wayton in Yorkshire. In recent years, RM rallies have been modified to suit many different needs. One example is this flatbed truck conversion on a 1947 RMA. Done in the 1970s, it was damaged two years ago, but will be restored eventually. Riley Motors never participated officially in competition, but with the help of the Motor Club, Riley dealers and enthusiastic owners, Riley's performed well. RM Riley's entered the Monte Carlo Rally in early 1949, and later that year, a Portuguese driver won first prize at the Rally de Soleil held in Cannes. Riley's then entered the Monte Carlo Rally every year until 1956, with such drivers as Tom Dog, Lyndon Sims and Rex Sutherland. Probably the best known competition Riley RM is regardless, TML 255, which is still around today. It was rallied extensively by Tom Dog and was owned for many years by John Byron, honorary president of the Riley RM Club. RMs were also raced. A roadster, AEN 10, was entered by Jeff Beetson in the 1950 Le Mans 24 hour race. It finished a creditable 17th out of 60 starters at an average speed of 74.22 miles per hour. RMs were used at weekend club events and circuit racing up and down the country. Pathfinders were also regular contestants in races, rallies and speed trials. The Riley RM series was promoted by advertising and brochures of often stunning designs. Riley Coventry Limited looked after the home market and Nuffield exports the rest of the world, with the Nuffield Press producing the majority of this material. RM rallies were featured on the covers of the house magazines of the Nuffield organisation such as the Rally Record and Motoring. Pathfinder brochures were particularly well put together as the cars were being aimed at upmarket customers. The RM Riley was popular with the toy makers of the day. The Riley Saloon was the first dinky in the post-war 40 series of British cars and was introduced in 1947 in four colours. In 1954 they were renumbered 158 and remained in production until 1960. Corgi Toys made the Riley Pathfinder between 1956 and 1961. It was available in red and blue, has windows but no interior details. The standard version was numbered 205 and a friction wheel version was also made until 1959. Corgi also issued a police version, number 209. Triang, manufacturers of the Minic toys and models, produced one and a half litre Rileys powered by clockwork motors, saloons in red and green, and a burgundy police car with friction drive complete with two policemen inside the car. International Model Aircraft Limited made the Penguin plastic bodied Riley in a variety of colours, propelled by a rubber band wound up by the starting handle. Other known toy Rileys include the Brad Scar, a miniature RM similar in size to the early Matchbox series. Shown here with a dinky to compare sizes. 
Riley RM models, as opposed to toys, started to appear in the early 80s with the Mick and Sue RME, sold either as a kit or ready assembled. Mini Mark 43 produced the superb RMB 143rd white metal model, complete in every detail, right down to the windscreen wipers. Several years later, they produced the RMF. In the 1990s, the Riley RM Club commissioned the Riley Roadster model, a limited edition now sold out. CMA produced self assembly kits of the RMA and the Bonolac drophead, high quality kits making up into superb models. Gems and cobwebs have made the model Pathfinder saloon and police cars, so keeping all types of RM alive in model form. And all new models are eagerly awaited by Riley enthusiasts. The Riley RM today is a much sought after classic, still available at a reasonable price, giving its owner a great deal of pleasure. Membership of the Riley RM Club is an essential part of ownership with its excellent spare service and support network. Here we are at the Riley Centenary Rally. Um, I'd like to introduce John Byron, the now honorary president of the RM Club, who was the founder member of the RM Club. Uh, John, can you uh, tell us your views on the progress of the club? Yeah, it's. Uh, I started it. As a, this is a joke, really, but I started it to save myself time and work because I was running two RMs in the 60s, and people kept coming to me and saying, "You know, I can't run one. How can you run two? So I thought, well, I'll start the club to pool information, basically, and then <clears throat> history overtook because in 1969, uh, BMC announced the demise of the Riley Mark, and I thought we ought to go around buying up all the parts, all the information, everything that was available, which was about to be junked, and we've grown from there. It's quite gratifying to know that we now have 1,800 members uh, worldwide. Um, come to something like this today, it's, as somebody said to me, <coughs> it's all your fault. That's the best compliment I've ever had. And where do you think um, you know, the club's going to go in the future? From strength to strength, I hope. Mm. <clears throat> I can't help feeling that, unless somebody's making them, we've accounted for 95% of the cars that, yeah. that, that are rescued, that could be rescued uh, to be used. Um, but it's our duty uh, from now on to keep the ones that are running running and yes if the effect if the occasional new one is found to be restored put back on the road well certainly the the spares uh, policy of the club has been very successful and as we've seen in the spares tent it's, it's quite an array and following on from your efforts originally it's certainly going in the right direction to keep the cars going yep well, I'm, I'm very pleased that it's worked out the way I wanted, which was initially I would have nothing to do with the social side. Uh, it was spare, spare, spares, keep the cars going. Now we can sit back and enjoy the social atmosphere of uh, the Riley world because the spares are there, the cars uh, much more reliable, possibly even more reliable than they were when they were new. Um, a great success. I'm very pleased. And certainly the international side of, of not just the RM Club, but um, the, the Riley scene, it's uh, been helped along no end by the, the, the spares policy of the RM Club. Yes, yes, that's, that's absolutely true. I've made a few enemies along the way by sticking to a policy, but I think it's paid off. Well, I, I'm pleased that... Uh, it has been such a successful weekend and uh, I'm sure that as far as, well, everyone in the RM Club, we owe you a gratitude from the initial formation of the club. Thank you, John. Well, thank you very much. And could I say, could I go on record on saying, this has been so successful, we ought to repeat it 
say, every five years. I'll second that, absolutely. Today, the spares operation is fully computerised with a purpose-built warehouse servicing members from all over the world. John Kirby, the spares secretary, not only receives help from his son, but has his grandson in training to ensure that spares for RM rallies are in safe hands for the future. The club provides opportunities to meet up with fellow rally owners from around the world and purchasing spares has become a global operation. I'd like to introduce two of our Antipodean friends, Jim Welsh from New Zealand and Paul Baye from Australia, who are over especially for the Centenary Rally. Perhaps the main point of topic is the continuing running of RM rallies down under. Jim, would you like to say a word first on how the spare situation has improved over the years? Well, right at this present time, it's absolutely marvellous. There's almost anything that we wish to have for our cars we can obtain through uh, the RM Club or one of the other parts people over here. Uh, things are being remanufactured. However, uh, winding back the hands of time a few years, uh, even as, as few as five years ago, uh, crown wheel and pinions were unavailable. Uh, for years, we've been running cars the diffs pack up, what are we going to do? There's none down there, so we've been adapting Vanguard diffs, Jag diffs. Now these can be removed, we've got crown wheel and pinions. Uh, there's many, many, many parts we've had to make do, find a way of uh, keeping our cars on the road. I presume you're much the same thing. Yes, yes, we make uh, pistons ourselves, all the gasket stuff, and we rely yeah. very heavily on yeah. the RM club for uh, yeah. part supply. Yeah. And yeah. then on the other side of it, I, I have weekly contact with uh, the parts people of the RM Club. Um, I've just reproduced or had reproduced in New Zealand 100 head gaskets. We've shipped them from New Zealand back over here. So there's a source of parts uh, from us back to, to you over here. Well, at the moment we're doing front suspension bushes in polyurethane, which, which we're going to supply to John Kirby. Oh, well, we're, we're actually waiting for that because my car needs those and uh, yes. and he's been saying, just hang on a while, just hang on yeah, a while. Well, yeah. the dies have been made, the samples have been run and they're in production yeah. now. They should be yeah. ready time I get back home. We're, we adapt uh, right at the moment because there's several of us uh, that are using cars as everyday use and in the heavy traffic, braking is a problem. Uh, we're starting to adapt disc brakes from Holden's onto them. Uh, so we're hoping to come up with a disc brake kit. Um, we're also playing with the odd five-speed gearbox because these cars were made before the Tarsia Road. Hmm. So uh, that's, that's just something that we're working on. Hmm. Mechanically, we have no problems with the, with the rough roads. Uh, it's more the body-wise, but that was because they weren't made for our roads. So again, we're rebuilding and using modern glues and screws that weren't available in those days. How many cars are actually in sort of daily use uh, down below? Uh, yeah. In Sydney, there's not so many that are used daily, but uh, in a lot of the other capital cities, there are. Perth, particularly, they use them a lot there. The traffic in Sydney's, you know, like driving in London, I guess, and uh, you know, so the users more, very much use second cars there and touring cars. If there's an event on or something to go to, they think nothing of just topping up with gas and away they go. Yeah, It's just a matter of checking it all out. Yeah. Well, that's uh, good to hear that they're still in regular use down below and uh, with the cooperation between yourselves producing spares and us producing spares and then going either way, looks like they're going to be on the road for a good few years. They yet, will be. Yeah. Whatever, you, whatever you do, always stop for a rally. <laughs> RM Rileys are in demand for film work and the Shadowlands filming at Shepperton Studios was a typical example where a 1949 RMB was filmed outside the Oxford bookshop a sequence that made the cutting room floor and never the big screen with their graceful lines and sense of presence RMs are in demand for weddings a useful sideline for some owners Just over 50 years has passed since the Riley RM series was introduced into a world hungry for new innovations after World War II. The world has changed out of all recognition since those days, but the Riley RMs still turn heads wherever they go, 
and evoke pleasant memories and reminiscences from complete strangers. Those fortunate enough to own and drive them still enjoy the luxury of a bygone age, the rich smell of the leather upholstery, superb road holding, and yet keeping up with modern traffic with ease. Truly, Truly magnificent, magnificent motoring. motoring.